Hello, Audrey. How are you? I am good. It's so good to see you. It's been a little bit. We got to hang out at the mastermind, but I know. Yeah, but not enough. <laughs> Never <laughs> enough. Never enough. Um, so I'm so excited you're here. I'm stoked to dig into your journey because it's been a wild ride, I know. Um, but yeah, why don't we just kind of get started by like walking us through literally how it kind of all unfolded for you, um, yeah. where you started, where things are now, and then where you're going. And I'll just ask questions along the way. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was actually a zookeeper for eight years. It was amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not so amazing. Well, it, Ideally. it was both. Yeah. 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 And I think like, one of the reasons I was excited to tell my story is that I think a lot of people can identify who have careers of passion, who like really threw everything into their career because zookeeping is very much a career of passion. Like that you cannot make much money. You work weekends and holidays all the time. Like there is just like so much that you're sacrificing for it. It's also a highly competitive career. There's a lot of people, even though you can't make a lot of money, there's a lot of people trying to get into the career. So I like did a bunch of unpaid internships and like worked for years to get where I was in that career. Um, and was like finally there. I pretty much like made it as good as I could as a zookeeper. I ended up working at a very prestigious place. Um, making pretty much the most money I could possibly make as a zookeeper without like moving up into management. And on paper, I had great benefits. Um, and everything, I was so miserable. <laughs> and it was, it was a culmination of like years of being in a career that probably really didn't suit me in the end. I loved the animals. Um, I loved certain aspects of my job, but the day-to-day was very repetitive and part of it was also the position I ended up in like some like just being a zookeeper can still be very different from position to position um but I ended up at a place where they had very very high standards um but not just standards that would like improve animal welfare but standards that were like minuscule procedural like <laughs> red tape that didn't yes, really need to be there. <laughs> red tape. Mm -hmm. And uh and I realized that like my brain was like not built for that. Like I'm a very type B personality. I like to like just kind of do things my own way and figure it out. And you know, what works for one person is not gonna work for somebody else. And that was like not it here. It was like you need to follow every single little thing. And it was a lot of like menial tasks. Um, so a lot of my day was just like repetitive every day. And we were very understaffed and overworked. So every single day, I like so overworked to the point that to get things done in a day, I would sometimes run from place to place to like- Oh my God. Like, so like, I like am almost like trembling thinking about it. Like oh. I was in like that high beta, like stress state all, all the time. time. Yeah. And then, like I said, we had really great benefits on paper, but actually like weren't allowed to use any of our time off and stuff. Like we would just, because we were understaffed, if you took a day off, someone else had to come in on their day off to fill in for you and stuff. Like it was, and yeah, so I was like so, so stressed um, and it, it bled into everything and eventually consumed my mental health. Mm. Um, and I like, yeah, it, um, and it's, it's been wild. I actually just had a friend that I was talking to that I hadn't seen in a while. And she's like, you're a whole different person. Mm. Like, I don't like just everything about you feels different now. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, because wow, I was like in and not in like a constant state of stress. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, and it was, it bled into everything, like I said, because it was the type of place that would text you on your day off about yeah. something work-related. And it was like, it just, oh yeah, I got, I had anxiety when my phone rang or like when I had a text, like it would ding and I'd be like, oh my God, I did something wrong. I made a mistake. And it's like, oh gosh. gosh um uh, yeah so and I actually found out from somebody who like went to school for something psychology related they went back to like grad school and they said they were studying like professional burnout and they said like in their textbook 
it talked about zookeepers and nurses. What? And that's it, like, so wild. <laughs> apparently, we are like the poster children <laughs> for burnout. <laughs> the burnout. Did you ever measure how far, how much you ran? Was like a Fitbit. Uh, well, I had I had a step counter, and I usually was hitting about eighteen thousand steps a day. Um, and that was usually my like when I got home from work, I had eighteen thousand. So I don't um, know. If that's a lot. Is that a lot? I, I mean, I've never counted steps. I the I guess the typical like goal that they try to have people go for is ten thousand. Okay. Um, for your whole day, and uh-huh. being a writer now on sedentary lifestyle, I know other people can understand this too. <laughs> like it's like hard to get to. Like, struggling to get to five like, like yeah yeah oh I wow better days but you know <laughs> I actually asked that because like the way you're describing it kind of reminds me of when I was an event planner and on yeah. weekends like when I was running events I like tr- I tracked it with like a thing and I would run like the equivalent of a half marathon oh my god yeah like just like madness and I was always so sore the next day but yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I was in great shape physically and mentally. I was like, mentally a disaster. <laughs> yep, that's exactly it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I looked great, but I was like, not okay in the head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I actually like knew that I wanted out. I was seeing a therapist, and like we had talked about it. And I was like, I need an escape plan. Like I like I need to get out. And what's crazy is during that time, I actually met my partner now who's like love of my life, like just like perfect. And so I actually think that took me through like an extra like year or two because my life outside of work was like finally like great in a lot of ways. But um, I think that that like carried me through some of that stress, but it also showed me like times where like I was in such a mental struggle that like he would like quote unquote criticize something I was like stirring a pot and he'd be like oh maybe we should risk that and I would like break down <laughs> like cry just like just like totally or like bite his head off or like what like, yeah, yeah. like yeah I was just like a mess um oh man I so and, that. <laughs> yeah and so some of that actually started to make me realize like how bad it really was mm-hmm. um and so yeah I finally like was like, okay, with or without, like, I couldn't figure out like what I would do after zookeeping. Like I just, I, right. I've always been a person of like many interests and stuff. And I was like, I have no idea what I would do after this. And I was like going back to like, I studied English and psychology in college actually. And it was the psychology part that got me into animal behavior that eventually took me into zookeeping. But um, it's funny how much that like now fits into copywriting, but I didn't even know that copywriting yeah. was a career. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How and also like how much this like college failed us that like I double majored in English and psychology and didn't know copywriting was a career. Like, right. <laughs> I actually really think college is like one of the best. One of my favorite classes I did, which I know is rare, was called a seminar class, and it basically was just like every class was an exposure to a new career opportunity within your field so it's yeah. super obscure like jobs and like and I was like this is what we need because yeah. there's just like we're like police officer doctor teacher nurse <laughs> like <laughs> astronaut those are like your options as a child so, yeah and it's like there's just so much more yeah yeah um, so yeah, I actually in the in the summer of so like winter of like 2019, I was like, I'm getting out of here. And mm-hmm. so my partner's a school teacher, so he has summers off. And I was like, May of 2020, I am quitting this job with or without anything else. Like I said, I was like making decent money then. I had I also like have realized since studying it that I typically have like kind of a scarcity mindset and I had been like saving and saving and saving. Mm-hmm. So I had kind of had this like savings account that I had no, no real plan for, but I just like felt like I needed to keep. Yeah. It. Like hoarding. You're just like, yeah, well, I don't know what I'm saving for, but. Ah. Yeah. And I think partially too, like being unpaid or very low paid for a long time did cue that in me where then oh. like once I was well paid, I still was just like saving. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I had a decent savings account. I was just like summer of 2020. I am quitting my job. I'm just going to like figure it out after that. 
Um, I know that I'm like a cap somewhere deep in me. I feel worthy and know that I'm a capable human being that can get a job and survive, mm -hmm. but I need to be out of this job before I can like really figure that out. Yeah. Well then of course, spring of 2020, <laughs> yeah. the pandemic hit and, uh, I felt grateful to have a job. <laughs> Right. Um, oh gosh. And yeah. so many people I knew were out of jobs and mm -hmm. everything else. And I actually had a really great living situation at the time. I um, was living with uh, basically my partner and two of my best friends. We were like all in our early thirties, like living in this house together. There was this giant house that we were able to rent because we lived in kind of a rural area. Uh -huh. So my rent was like $450 a month, like not <laughs> That's so, nice. <laughs> like minimal expenses, living with my yeah. best friends. Um, and like summer of 2020, my work actually realized that we were in a very precarious situation because we were so short staffed and we had these small teams caring for dangerous animals. Like I cared for carnivores. So mm -hmm. I was here caring for like cats, large cats. And, and yeah. That's so and cool was, though. I know it was stressful, but it's still so cool. <laughs> but what they realized is with like quarantine protocols, if one person got sick on a team, we worked so closely together, you'd have to quarantine the whole team. Mm -hmm. And then we had no one else who knew how to feed these animals safely. Oh my gosh. So what they ended up doing was doing split teams where we actually worked half the amount of time. So I would work like Monday or Sunday through Wednesday. And then another team would take over mm -hmm. Thursday through, or the other half of our team would take over like Thursday through Saturday. Mm -hmm. And we, I think we were trading off Wednesdays. So I was working either three or four days a week and still making full-time salary. You were like, wait, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, I can hang on a little longer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, okay, like I have all this time to recoup from my really stressful couple days. Oh, that was very gift. stressful because like we already yeah. were short staffed and then we were like even more short staffed on those days. So you were just like getting the bare minimum done. But yeah, so I held on even longer. And then in the fall of 2020 was when I discovered Right Your Way to Freedom. And this was after I'd spent all summer working half time and not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. I was literally like taking like random online courses mm -hmm. that were like free on Coursera and stuff. I like took a physics course because I was like, I don't know, maybe I'll like this. Yes. I, mean, <laughs> I feel that when you don't know, you're just like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it was literally like anything. I don't yeah. Know. Um, I had like as a child, one of my aspirations was to like be a novelist. Like I always mm -hmm. like, wanted to write, but I thought that the only way to do that was be a starving artist. Yes. Um, but clearly I had been like researching some kind of writing jobs because that's how the algorithm found me. Yes. Um, <laughs> and yeah, uh, got your like mini course for free. I was like obsessed from day one. Um, I was that person that like, I like went to the bathroom and like took a quick break to like watch your video when you would <laughs> <laughs> oh my god so funny it was like definitely like I I was so drawn to this idea that I could like be a well-paid writer set uh -huh. my own hours all of these things and I think too coming from a job where everything was like so procedurally set mm -hmm. it didn't mm -hmm. even regimented yes. it was like oh my god I could like the autonomy was like so attractive to me mm -hmm. um and yeah, I, I was obsessed and I was like, I wanted to buy the course. And I remember that timer, timer ticking down, but the scarcity thing too, I was like, mm. am I really gonna, I had never spent that much money on like a course. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, college was like its own thing, right? But like, <laughs> yeah, totally. Like, just like do an online course. And I actually didn't tell anybody because I was like scared somebody was gonna talk me out of it. Cause I knew that like, people were distrusting of online courses and stuff. And mm -hmm. I just knew people would be like, this sounds great, but like, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. And I finally just like, I just bought it like secretly and like threw myself into it. And very quickly it was like, okay, I have to tell my partner because like, <laughs> I'm like yeah. hiding away, like doing coursework. <laughs> that is so funny. I think yeah. it's an interesting part of your story. I actually want to like call out because 
it's not, I would never like say, don't tell people in your life, but I always am like, be careful of who you tell, because if they've never like Mm -hmm. done anything like this, they're going to just be scared and like scared for you. And, um, so you just always have to think about like who you share, what, and when, because the people in our lives are usually giving us fear-based advice based on their own personal experience or lack thereof, you know? I think my own fear too had to be like influenced a little bit from my own mother like wanted to change careers multiple times and she would always go back and take online college courses Mm -hmm. and then she would never finish like she always ended up like she'd make it through like one semester and then she'd be like I need to take a break again because like she was raising kids and working a full-time job and And trying to switch careers yeah yeah and so she like never like fully made that leap and actually did it and I think that like so I knew that like maybe telling her too, her own experience would tell her oh, that, like, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. going to work or like, right. and I also watched her do that. So I was scared for myself that it wasn't going to work, or, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, it definitely like influences you in a way and stuff. And, totally. Um, but it's so important to remember that like the opportunities she had available to her and what exists today in today's online world are just like literally worlds apart. Oh yeah. <laughs> like Completely. the world has changed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's so, yeah. so then you dug in, dug in, um, definitely personally identified with overconsuming. <laughs> I, I never felt ready. I was like, had to like overconsume and overconsume. And the, one of the biggest classic, things, classic, it's like, yeah, we all do it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. One of the things that helped me was, um, getting accountability buddies. I had a little group. I actually, I posted in the group when I started the 30 day copy hand copy challenge. I was like, I kind of want to like get more out of this. Like I felt like I wanted to like analyze the copy, not just write mm-hmm. it. And mm-hmm. for me, group learning has always helped that. Should. So yes. I posted in the group and was like, does anybody want to start like a like a group study session once a week for like the hand copy challenge? Tons of people replied. And then I actually set a date and time and two people showed up. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> It ended up being perfect. We were like this great little like trio, Amanda and Julia, you guys see this and I love you and thank you so much. <laughs> and are you guys still in touch and like hang like uh, yeah. Still in touch, yes, definitely. I actually got to meet, go and visit Julia in real life um this past spring. Yeah. Yes. And it was amazing. Yeah. So we're still like keep up and and keep on account of accountability with each other. Um but yeah, uh we did that for for weeks well past the 30-day challenge we just kept meeting once a week and like setting goals and keeping each other accountable um and yeah that makes a huge difference because even if it was like like writing my website copy was such a huge hurdle for me and it's It's really hard there's something about writing copy for your own stuff that's just like way harder Oh yeah. And I like, I was like trying to be more original or something. And I like wrote some like crazy stuff to start, but it was like having that accountability of being like, I'm going to show up with something to my group, even though it's not done. It's never done. (laughs) You know, it's like, okay, I just like wrote this crazy crap thing. I went through so many iterations before I actually did it, but yeah, um, it was that, that got me a lot further than I think I would have on my own Mm -hmm. um, for sure. And yeah, so spring of like 2021, I guess it was, I was kind of, I started working on portfolio pieces um, and talking about like, like moving forward without everything like perfectly in place. I never liked my portfolio pieces. Mm-hmm. I like, I kept like being like, no, they're not good enough or whatever. I never put them on my website. <laughs> I kept like trying new things too with like new, I, would, I was like writing pieces for friends or whatever. And um yeah and uh your advice about like making sure somebody pays or something <laughs> yes and because they will value it more too yes because I had um I wrote somebody's web copy and wrote a a couple welcome emails for them it wasn't a ton of work it was like for um but she was an artist and she was gonna like do a logo for me in exchange mm-hmm. um but she got like totally bogged down with work and stuff this was like her side gig and so I wrote all this stuff for her and it was months before she did anything with it. Mm-hmm. So that copy I actually liked, but I couldn't, I didn't have it live. I could use it as samples, yeah. but I didn't have yeah. the live copy to show. Um, 
Mm. stuff like that so yeah definitely like you know if you charge your friend then they'll be like oh I need to cut this up because I paid money for it seriously even if it's just a little, little bit. bit yeah even if it's just and a little it bit. walks you through the process of like collecting payment just like mm-hmm. all the little steps all the little hurdles that feel scary you kind of yeah. get that, like that first itch scratched and it's yeah. like yeah. <laughs> so definitely like all the advice that you gave and then I ignored and then I learned the lesson the hard way um <laughs> happens sometimes <laughs> you are not the first to ignore the <laughs> advice and then go oh I should have done that <laughs> yes um but yeah I was it was very slow process of course like I was I was working full-time and I was also really struggling mentally um mm-hmm. so I was chipping away you know the the 30 minutes a day I was trying but it wasn't happening all the time you know mm-hmm. um the thing that was helping me a lot is I would listen to things because I could. So technically we weren't allowed to have headphones on at work because it's like mm-hmm. a safety hazard if you're, mm-hmm. you know, working around dangerous things. I literally like had my smartphone like tucked in my bra strap. Yeah. <laughs> like listen to things while I was like, I was like washing dishes half the time and stuff. Like listening to like live Q and A's and lessons and stuff. And oh yeah. Just yeah. like absorbing knowledge and. That's um, a good way to do it though. Yeah. 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 Especially and I definitely am one of those people who listened to the entire course before I had actually like done all of the work <laughs> sheets yeah. and everything. But then I went back and worked through it. I think that's like the important part, you know, it's like, yeah. it's one thing if you have more listening time than you have activity time right like then right. making sure you go back and do it because I did the emotional technique challenge and I did yeah you yeah, know, yeah went through it all um but it took me a long time and it was uh so spring of 2021 I finally just was like I was done I was like done making excuses obviously we'd gone back to full schedule like in the fall I think of 2020 and um and I was miserable again and I was just like can't make it any further like I got to pull the plug on this even though I didn't have a single client yet Mm -hmm. I I, all I had were like my little um portfolio piece projects that I had done for friends and like a non-profit blog you know or something like um and I, I quit my job and after that so then I basically took the summer off I was like working a little bit trying to get my website up and um And also I was sending cold emails then. So I would like work like an hour or two hours in the morning and then like take off with my partner because we would like just spending a fun summer together, especially after the pandemic and everything. I mean, it wasn't really over, but we could take like car trips and go camping and stuff. And um, finally like letting ourselves have that adventure time. Yeah. I I had a lot of time with him because I worked weekends and holidays all the time. Right. It was funny because being a teacher, it's like he has a lot of time off technically, like he gets all of the breaks, but they don't actually have a lot of flexibility with their time. He can't take off like personal days all the time because it's like, well, no, you get fall break, you get summer break. (laughs) Right. But like you have the time off, so you have no say when you're working. Like when when you have to work work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. meditation together. Uh, Um, Yeah. So getting that. I'm really glad. I just have to say, I really admire in this story one that you um, you just stuck with it, even though it took longer. You know. Yeah. You didn't that was up. hard too, because it was yeah. like also I, I set a lot of ambitious goals for myself, and then like plowed right over them and didn't like just was like, well, crap. <laughs> like, yeah. That feels yeah. crappy. Like. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. you, kept, you kept with it. Like it's so it's so impressive um because it takes some mental resilience and also I love that you took some time to just like enjoy some like time with your partner because you got you hadn't really had that opportunity with your last job like I think people put so much pressure on themselves you know to like make it work and if it doesn't work in a certain time frame or or compared to somebody else in the course in the community then they're like I'm a failure so I don't know I'm sure you've had thoughts like that sometimes but like it obviously didn't like consume you Right. Yeah. But I will say that it was hard. And I like definitely I, somebody used this term one time. And it's kind of like you said with that <laughs> imposter syndrome, you don't want to give it too much power, but kind of having a term for it did help a little bit. The comparisonitis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, comparing yourself to these other people's journeys is like was really damaging in a lot of ways. But it was so helpful to see actually watching student success stories was one of my go-tos for like being like re-inspired. 
because seeing how other people had gotten through their barriers, like mm -hmm. really did show me that there were 101 ways to do this. Yes. Like it's also why I intentionally like try to bring in people who have done it like very different. Like I, the value of one of the values of your story in particular is that it took you like longer, like a little bit longer, but like that right. is so important for people to hear. Yeah. You know and I, mean? I think it was, yeah. And I, I listened to, I don't remember whose story, there was at least like probably two or three stories that were mm -hmm. kind of like me where they had taken longer. And I was like, oh wow. And they like still like got there. And actually this is one of the things where like you kind of had to convince me to do my student success story that yes. I was ready. That's always what happens when somebody's <laughs> like, I don't know that I'm actually a student success story because it kind of took me a while. I'm like, you are definitely a student success story, <laughs> especially because well, it's also, longer. Like, I felt like I wasn't hitting those numbers yet. Like I was like just barely like scraping 5k months now. And you're, it was you, like <laughs> you prioritized your mental health. You took some right. time off with your partner to like, yeah. you know, reconnect and like rekindle and heal yourself after a really stressful career. Like those are massive wins, massive yeah. wins. Absolutely. And not everybody wants 10K plus months, like truly. So not, like we talk about it because I think it's important for people to see expanders and know like what's possible. I do think that's important like financially, but like it's also okay if you want to stick at 5K months, like that's there's like nothing wrong with that you know yeah. like I don't know. yeah and I think too teaching myself to slow down and enjoy the journey because like I'm this is something where like hustle culture has definitely I wasn't really super exposed to hustle culture until I got into copywriting mm -hmm. and started following a lot of copywriters and being in that kind of online business industry mm -hmm. it it gets to you at some point where like people are like, well, you know, you just put in like really hard work for two years and then you get to coast or whatever. And it was like, I realized that like, and this took time. I, for a while I was like, okay, this is my time. I'm putting in the hard work or whatever. And then I would like have to slow myself down and be like, oh, I'm driving myself crazy again. And like, mm -hmm. and then I like kind of had this realization semi-recently that like, I'm really okay with my pace. Mm -hmm. And I want to enjoy this time mm -hmm. and not sacrifice two years to mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. get 10 K months and then mm -hmm. be, eventually be less yeah. or whatever. like, I was like, no, like, definitely <laughs> don't need to sacrifice or have two years of hustle to get to 10 K months. Like, it's just like, it doesn't need to happen like that. Also, yeah. I would say like, cause I have periods of hustle and I talk about it in the community um, but none of them have been ever longer than six months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like this is the longest one I've gone through actually was when we like changed everything about the course, like it started yeah. in January of this year. We like just completely <laughs> restructured it and like moved off of Facebook and did so many changes and updates and like brought on a team. And it's just been like madness, but yeah. like the best possible way. And that was like the, my longest period of hustle. Like most of my like periods of hustle where I'm like building something new or learning a new skill, They've only been like three months, like, cause I can't maintain that forever. And it's not what I want. It's like literally not why I started copywriting and I have to remember that. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, uh, so I'll talk about one of probably my like transformative period of hustle yeah. <laughs> in the fall of 2021, I was kind of fed up with myself. I was like, I mean, and I had taken off the summer intentionally, but it was also hard to like mentally do that where you're like, no, I should be building my business. Oh, no, I should. Like, it, so it was definitely like a struggle where like I wanted to spend more time. Um, and so when, when my partner went back to teaching, um, I was kind of like also starting to like see my savings account very much dwindle, right? Like yeah. I, had, I had six months of savings, but at this point it had been like, <laughs> I think I had taken like at least four months off. So I was like, okay, this is getting down to like, <laughs> I really yeah. have to start making money. Um, and at that point I had one client that was a referral from, and this is, I think a good topic too, is like planting the seeds a little way because I had one client with a test project for a blog. There was a referral from the group and that was amazing. And it was like in, I wanted to do like sustainability because that was kind of where I was coming from. And the zookeeper was like conservation and um, mm -hmm. sustainable sciences and stuff. And that was something I was really interested in. So I ended up kind of in the sustainable e-commerce niche um, because of that. And 
this client fit perfectly in there. I did a test project for them. Uh, actually, the first draft totally, like, just was did not go over well. <laughs> um, which partially was that they told me they were rebranding and they had a whole new brand voice and they wanted this like sassy activist voice. And I was like, okay, this will be fun. And I like, but they did. I asked them for an example of writing and they gave me a brand book, which doesn't actually have much writing in it at all. Mm -hmm. um, and they were like, ooh, this was like way off base. And I was like, and then they were like, here's an example of a blog that we really liked that somebody did for us previously. And it was like from the other right, you were a freedom student who used to work for them. Um, and it was a completely different tone. <laughs> Oh no. Like, okay, so I rewrote the entire blog in this completely new tone. Also like hired an editor immediately. It was like I need like I had used friends as editors, like copywriter other copywriters, my accountability buddies, um, as editors because I was like still didn't want to spend money on an editor and stuff. Totally. I did but that immediately too. for that second draft. Yeah. An editor was like, I gotta get this right. And they loved it, the second draft. So I was like, wanna put that out there for people too. Like stuff happens, you're gonna bomb sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> like, and you will live. You will learn. <laughs> Feels like you're dying, but you will live. <laughs> but yeah. They said they loved it. And then they were like, actually, we don't really have a budget to continue with you right now. And just like it was gone. And I was like, oh my God. Oh man. Um, and then, so over the course of like the spring and summer, I had sent about a hundred cold emails. I had like one or two client calls that I thought went well, and then they never booked a project. Whoa. Um, I was like getting kind of sad and desperate <laughs> and also frustrated with myself. And I was just like, I have to also, I need, it was taking me probably an hour or two per email. Mm -hmm. okay wow <laughs> I gotta streamline this I gotta figure out what's working what's not started like really truly batching my emails I kind of was before but like this time I like really dug into batching um I actually figured out like okay if I found a, a client that I thought would be a good fit I would actually just like google their product or keywords around their product mm -hmm. and of course it would give me like 20 more companies that are doing basically the same thing yes. and then so that I would batch those all and cold email all of them yes and I in a two-week span I of sent 200 meeting. cold emails yeah 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 in September uh-huh those 200 cold emails that I sent after in September uh -huh. carried me through March of 2021 with work. with clients yeah, yeah. Yes, there it is. I didn't send another cold email until like April of 2021 or uh, 2022. Yeah. Listen, Audrey doesn't give up. <laughs> That's like the title of this story. <laughs> and it is so impressive because instead of just being like completely discouraged and like, you're like, okay, we know this works. Yeah. Obviously I got to like go back to the drawing board, yeah. you know? And I was reworking my cold email that whole time. Like, yeah. Having other people look Better. at it, like, yes, yeah. Um, and also refining who I was emailing was a big part of that too. I found out that like a lot of the companies that were emailing were just like way too small mm -hmm. to hire a copywriter at this time. Yeah. Um, and then like a lot of the, yeah, I just kind of like got on like tangents that weren't helpful. So yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so in the fall, they were like trickling in and this is something too, for like cold email people that are in that <laughs> trench. <laughs> um, they, the, like I said, I sent all 200 of those in two weeks and I was getting consult calls in November mm -hmm. from the emails I sent in September. Like they yep. were just like, like, yep. oh, Hey, I saved your email. I meant to get back to you. And like, totally. and the client that I had done over the summer, that one test blog, they came back in December mm -hmm. and said, we have a whole new budget for content marketing. We want to start doing two blogs a month at like your price and yeah, yeah. and yeah so like you're I planting mean, seeds and you just don't know it and that's the yeah. thing. that's why like the beginning is always the hardest yeah because you're like you're planting seeds you're waiting for the little sprouts to come up and you're just like did I kill them are they alive yeah. <laughs> Do you have too much water enough sun I don't know 
you know That's exactly how it felt <laughs> and you're just, like waiting for like food to come <laughs> for yeah. your like garden to grow <laughs> and I was completely convinced that I had drowned all those seeds like I yeah. did you're not like, I, I ruined them stuff. they're gone and yeah. then they just start coming up yeah and that's how it's been like the whole time because even, yeah, like I got, I got two new clients in December that were, like I said, I didn't cold email after September. They were people who just like had saved my email or were coming back from after a test yeah. project, whatever. And um, yeah, so <laughs> December was a, was a two week period of hustle too, because I decided I was going to take off the whole Christmas break that my mm -hmm. partner had. I wanted to take off the same time he had off. Mm -hmm. And I was determined to do it. And I did, I worked probably like, you know, we, we say like an 80 hour week. It wasn't actually that, but I was like working after dinner a lot of nights, like to like that, the one week before I took that vacation, but I made a 6K month. Yeah. In December. It took some and serious didn't time work off. for two weeks. Like, yeah. That was big. That showed me like what I was capable of. Yeah. Um, and that also like brought on some new clients. So mm -hmm. then in the winter, I was like, okay, I'm ready to like refine this because yes. I had basically taken on a ton of work and it was a lot of low paying clients <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a lot of low paying retainers. Mm -hmm. And so I actually had, um, I had a post in the group about a month ago, I think, or something where I talked about the fact that I was no longer going to incentivize retainers and it kind of got a lot of interesting comments of, uh, that and people thought that I was like totally giving up retainers and I was like, no, okay. To clarify, <laughs> I would like to eventually have a business without retainers. Yeah. Um, I would like, I think I would like the VIP day model kind of thing, maybe not a day, but I've seen somebody now who's like doing like VIP week intensives or something like that, where like, mm -hmm. so you do like project by project, week by week. I get a lot of satisfaction from like finishing a project and like mm -hmm. bringing it in and being done with it. Like that feels so great to me. And I also get a lot of energy from starting something new. And I've realized this about myself as I've worked through these months of work and stuff. So I have my retainers who I love and just love these clients and stuff, but it doesn't bring me a lot of like new fresh energy to like mm -hmm. sit down and do their work. That said, there are advantages to retainers where like their work takes right. me less time because right. I already know their voice and I already know the subject. Right. And I hardly have to do any research anymore. So I'm like making money on these retainers, but yeah, it's not what I love doing. So to clarify from that post, because I think I like, a lot of people are like, what? How do you do it without retainers? <laughs> Well, now, now you mostly today you may you just write emails, right? So or not mostly. just emails, still. But because that's your focus is on emails, email copywriting, right? Yeah. So over the the winter, I redid all of my website copy to focus mm -hmm. on emails. So all of my outward marketing now is the fact that I'm an email copywriter. That's all I advertise that I do. I still get asked to do everything under the sun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is what everybody says. Everybody who niches says, like, you're not going to limit yourself because everybody's still going to ask you to do everything. Right? That's what and I always true. say. I'm like, guys, <laughs> don't make it a problem before it's a problem. And it's not going to be a problem. Like, yeah. people, I get people asking me to write, like, copy for lawyers. I'm like, no, I don't know anything about that industry. I cannot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I still have a couple of blog clients. Um, but part of my like new thing that I've been trying to do is actually maybe outsource those blogs. Mm -hmm. Um, it's still nice for me to have them as retainers because it's like money to fall back on. It's a, that kind of like, mm -hmm. it does like feel nice to just know that I have that much money coming in. Um, yeah. but I am getting more and more email projects. And so as I get more email projects, I'm outsourcing some blogs to make time mm -hmm. on my calendar for the higher paying email projects. Right. Yeah. And also I think a good thing about that is because it still maintains like, look, I stopped writing blogs. Oh my gosh. Probably like three, four, no, four years ago, probably. Um, but I had one client that I just loved and yeah. I, still wrote, <laughs> I still wrote her blogs because I just like loved her and I loved the relationship we built and she like trusted me. So it's just like, that's the other thing about being a freelancer. I was like, sometimes you just like make exceptions. You're like, this is the direction I'm going, but like, 
I don't know, you have a particular relationship with a client or they like just things work well, or you really believe in like what they're doing. And so you're just yeah. like, okay, for you, I'll do this, you know? Yeah. Also, I just got to say, cause sometimes people like feel like they're not a real copywriter if they just write blogs and I'm like, dude, it's fine. If it feels good and easy to have the same client and have the same retainer and write this like for the same businesses and just like simplify your life like that is okay too like literally this is why I love your story like there's just everybody has to figure out what works for them and when you figured out that like you like fresh energy that comes with fresh projects um and then you had the client acquisition confidence to be like okay well that's going to require me needing to like be solid in my client acquisition strategies yeah. to generate new projects yeah like you were able to step into that and that's like the refinement of this process is so important because it's how you make it like work for you. And so and I love like that. building your network and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And that's one of the things where actually like one-off projects, the, the other thing that I like about one-off projects um, kind of the advantages to it. Cause I actually, it's funny. I have a, another accountability buddy, Hannah. I think she's here too. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> Hannah and I have been like, with each other for months and months now just like every little thing every email we send to a client like can you look this over <laughs> I love so, that. yeah uh she's helped me through so much but um it was funny because when we first started chatting she was like I need more retainers and I was like I need more one-off projects and it was so funny because we were like seeing the pros and cons of both from each of our sides of things where she was like I just need to know that I have like rent covered every month and I was like sitting there like, see, I'm seeing this side of it where I got a bunch of retainers first, like at the get-go, like almost every single one of my clients, I actually think every single one of my clients turned into a retainer at the beginning, mm -hmm. which was kind of crazy. But also like those were retainers that I started at my starting prices. Mm -hmm. And also I had a network of five clients. <laughs> yeah. Because they all turned into retainers. And that was my entire network of people who I'd ever done copywriting for. Yes. And so I realized that like having one-off projects is like, okay, you can do a website package, realize that you undercharged and then charge more the next one that you get. And the very next one that you get, you can raise your prices again and the very next one. But when you're on a retainer, you can raise your prices, but it's a little bit more stressful or like you have to have a conversation and you know, mm -hmm. make sure you're your value or something to your client. Like it just, it feels harder a little bit. I know that that's a little bit of a mindset. <laughs> no, but it's also, it's just, yes, there's, yeah. there's truth to it. Yeah. Yeah. And to talk about that though, because people who haven't raised your prices, if you've been thinking about it, like I said, I had a lot of those clients that started in the fall. In the spring, I decided to raise all my prices. I went from 250 a blog to 350 a blog with my clients and both of them kept me one of them said, oh, we're happy with your work. We'll just, that's fine. We'll keep going. And they actually added more. <laughs> and then the other one did reduce my work a little bit, but kept the same retainer right. price and less work. So, right. Yeah. But that's okay. Cause it's like, yeah. you're still earning more for that like secret hourly rate. And like, yeah. it's fine. It's and like, it allowed me to then outsource blogs a little bit because I was mm -hmm. making more per blog and stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that's been... Yeah, read one of the questions. And I, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, yeah. Because one of the questions that sub was submitted and I feel like is really relevant right now is like, so how, and it just feels like, um, and, and we've kind of covered it, but like dig into it a little bit is like, how do you make a full time income based solely on emails? Yeah, so that's been a little bit of um, a, a transition for me. So I follow a lot of email copywriters because that's what I discovered that I liked and I wanted to do it. I also discovered that I don't like SEO. So I'm always amazed by people who do. I'm like, great. Thank God there are people like you. <laughs> yeah. I just like, I, I feel my creative brain doesn't like feeling like restricted to keywords and stuff. Like it just, I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, and I get really into like the storytelling aspect of like sales sequences and, and things like that. I actually suspect that I would like sales pages, but I haven't really gotten the opportunity to dig into oh, yeah. it. So I'm like dipping my toes. Oh, you just pitch that to your clients. When, right. they, when the time <laughs> going to happen, this is like my favorite ways. You have a client and then they like, you see there's a need for a sales page and you're like, I can do that. And you already yeah. have a relationship with them. And then, then you do it and you grow. This is yeah. the best. 
Yeah, so I think that the, the email game is kind of split a little bit. And this is where I'm, I'm actually like heading on my own shift um, now. And it's interesting because like that's one of those things where like there's never really a destination. Just know that like like I was like, okay, I'm going to niche into email and then that's my destination. And then it was like, now that I'm in email, I see this other path that I kind of want to take. And you can, you're, you're an entrepreneur, like, do what you want. <laughs> and it's just a journey. And like thinking yes. about that as like, nothing's ever a mistake. You're just like following these different paths and you don't even know what exists until you get further on the path. <laughs> um, but I kind of have found that like, there's people who really go hard on e-com emails. Mm -hmm. And if you, and I think, um, I think one of the questions too is just like, how do you get started doing emails or like how you, um, and it, that was kind of the thing that did work for me was that pitching e-commerce clients, they always need emails. Always. So that's an easy get your foot in the door on emails. Mm -hmm. um, and they and they need a lot of emails. So if you mm -hmm. can write email quickly, you can fill yourself up on clients who need mm -hmm. not just sequences that are automated, but like they need a roster. Some, some e-commerce companies email every single day. So yeah. they need 30 emails a month. Like you can charge a pretty premium price for 30 emails a month. <laughs> Especially because there's a direct ROI associated with those emails. Like right. it's, it's emails, that question, how can you make a full-time uh, income based solely on emails? To me, made me think that maybe, I don't know who submitted this. Like I'm just calling this out. So you don't think I'm being harsh, but I'm like, <laughs> that just told me that you might not understand the value of emails and values are extreme. Our emails are extremely valuable. Like- yeah so so valuable possibly one of the most valuable types of copy out there like that in sales pages or like yeah so if you can get into emails and into people i'm working with people who need them like they know the importance of emails you know yeah <laughs> um, yeah and they're fun because i really like that you get a chance you know i always say it's like you're talking to them in their virtual living room and it's like an opportunity to like have a like a well, one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone and like get more intimate than you than you would in like an Instagram post or blog or website or any other form of connection with like an audience. So I love emails. They're my favorite. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> um, anyway, for my own like transition a little bit has been realizing that while I still love writing emails and I, I still like writing e-commerce emails, but I've realized that what I love writing even more than e-commerce emails is these kind of like personal brands and online coaches and um, course creators and stuff because they tend to have much more personal story-based emails mm -hmm. and I do really love writing that. Yeah. Um, and so that's been my own kind of transition now is being like, ooh, maybe I wanna get away from e-commerce and move more towards this mm -hmm. course creator thing. And so niching into emails actually really worked for me in that I'm able to just kind of follow, like I just say that I'm an email expert and I can work for whatever industry I want. You know? And I kind of just am like shifting my messaging a little bit more towards the mm -hmm. course creator side of things and stuff. Um, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Journey's never done. No. <laughs> when you're, you know, when you're doing this journey, like kind of like for yourself, right. You know, I, you like nothing's wasted. Nothing's lost you. It all just like takes you to the next place. And so yeah. who knows what it'll be. Maybe sales pages. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I'm curious, I always love to ask, like, if you could talk to yourself when you were first starting this journey, what would you say? Yeah. You, you know, um, like <laughs> freaking out Audrey, like when she I know, was like, I know. And so stressed out, like how, what would you, what would you say to sweet, sweet, stressed out Andrew, Audrey? <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. I would just say like, it's going to work. Mm -hmm. and take your time and and just know that you know you can do it and also like pushing past the fear barriers mm -hmm. and just doing it like I um somebody posted in the group a couple of days ago about like you always are going to be a beginner like for a certain period of time so you just have to like get the beginner myth over with like yes that's and, a great like, point and, like become and uh <laughs> Actually, so I'm obsessed with Harry Potter. <laughs> yes, I like kind of figured out this like visualization that really helps me um, when I'm like realizing that I'm really scared of something. And that's like little yeah. Harry Potter, the first time that he like has to get onto platform nine and three quarters and he's got to like run through 
brick, a wall. brick wall. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I love this so much. <laughs> And that's what they tell them is they're like, you better do it at a bit of a run because like, it just like, basically like the momentum will carry you through when you like think oh. when you're going to like flinch and like stop, you know, but like, you got to just like run through it. Yes. And I love that, like that idea in my head is just like, when I'm afraid of something, I'm like, no, I gotta like, do it at a bit of a run. <laughs> I gotta like do it at a bit of a run and just like do it. And then like on the other side, there's a train that's going to take you to Hogwarts. <laughs> Yes. Oh my God. It's like one of my favorite like metaphors I've ever heard. I love that. Um, <laughs> Got to do it at a bit of a run. That's like do it a bit of a run. Do it at yeah. a bit of a run. <laughs> Into the brick wall. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That was so lovely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Because I know lots of people are going to love that one. That's yeah. gold. Gold. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Audrey, for sharing your story. I know it's going to resonate with people. Well, um, I'm so, so impressed at how you just didn't give up. Like, truly, <laughs> you're like such a shining example of like what what can be if you just simply like don't give up and you just keep putting one <laughs> foot in front of the other. So thank you so much for taking the time to share your story with us. I really appreciate thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I, I can't get over it. Like, uh, and I'm like Amanda, like I, I think she did her success story was just like, it's so surreal to be here <laughs> like, doing my student success story, like, because I've watched so many of them. Um, well, yeah. I'm not surprised, not at all, so. Um, well, thank you so much. Thank you guys all for being here. I was so lovely and uh, everybody do it at a bit of a run, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's the takeaway. <laughs> All right. Bye. Have a lovely rest of your day. Bye.